Hi, my name is Vincent, and I will talk to you today about a pet project of mine called Tech Names as a Service. Um, it's, it's kind of a, a sort of a hobby project, um, and I will basically explain how this hobby project came to be. The math behind it is actually more interesting than you might think. Now, you might be wondering, who am I? My name is Vincent. I've been working for three years over at a company called Go to the Driven. You might also know me from my blog, Koning.io. I'm the chair of Padeta Amsterdam. I'm a preferred training partner for our studio. In Amsterdam, I host a machine learning meetup. I give free sessions in open data. Next week, I get to give a Python course to, uh, to I think, 30 Syrian refugees, which is going to be awesome. Also, I've got 39 endorsements for awesomeness on my LinkedIn profile. Uh, basically, I'm a data consultant. I do data stuff. And one of the main features of my LinkedIn profile is this picture of me in a ball pit and lots of Pokemon you see at the top, and I call myself Pokemon Master. I would hope that this would deter recruiters on my LinkedIn profile, but this is not the case. To emphasize even more what my LinkedIn profile is like, this is the keyword bingo that I post on it. Um, I will leave you to sort of check it out, and hopefully you understand the joke. Because this is how the whole thing started. Um, if you look carefully, you'll see things like Python and JavaScript and Shiny and Dplyr and Purr and Lodash and Vulpix. Um, I typically ask recruiters to point out which of these are Pokemon. It turns out that it's very, very hard for a recruiter to know the difference between the Pokemon and the big data technology. Oh. <laughs> um, so, you know, I am kind of mean, but I do think it's kind of ridiculous if you're trying to offer me the best job ever that you don't know the difference between Metapod and Unity. It's, thing, I think. Uh, so that's basically where all of this started. I, I, I started noticing that, hey, recruiters really have a bad time doing this, and it's actually kind of a fun game I play with recruiters online. I'm kind of a mean person, and I shouldn't really blame them too much, because there's this other, if you, go, if you go on GitHub, there's this uh, repo called Repokemon, and basically it's all the GitHub projects out there that are named after Pokemon, so the recruiters aren't even wrong when they think it's a big data technology. There's actually something called Jolteon, there's something called Golem, etc. Um, anyway, fun fact, but the main idea I had was, hey, uh, apparently there, there's some truth in that Pokemon names sound like big data technologies, and I can imagine if you're a hip startup in Silicon Valley, then you probably need a good name, and if you can use Pokemon as a nice corpus to start from, actually that might be a nice app. Let's sort of make an app that makes names that sound like Pokemon. That sort of that seemed like an interesting idea. Uh, and this kind of got me on this adventure for fun and profit. Um, so this is the end product that I want to make. I want to have some sort of web app that will generate names on your behalf. Uh, preferably to sound like Pokemon, but maybe other things as well. Um, so the task at hand then is, given a sequence of tokens, can we generate a sequence of tokens that is different, but believably similar? So it has to be a different Pokemon name, but it has to sound as if it's a Pokemon name. And these are things like, you know, Pokemon, obviously. Uh, Things have to. Pokemon is a nice example, but if you think about it, Red Hot Chili Pepper lyrics also kind of fall into that. You have these words that Red Hot Chili Peppers use in their lyrics, and you might also be able to generate lyrics that sound as if the Red Hot Chili Peppers could have written them. IKEA furniture names, I think, is also an excellent example for uh, lots of this. Notes on the piano also fall into this category. If you're playing notes in a certain melody, in a certain tune, in a certain chord, with a certain style, also that I can see as a sequence of tokens that you should be able to generate. So this is kind of a common task, and anything Ipsum basically works this way as well. So this is, this, this is the formal task that I'm going to try to tackle. Um, I will now have to probably re-enter my uh, Wi-Fi password. I'm going to give you a quick demo of the web app. You can already play with it. It's on uh, tenas.com, technamesasaservice.com. If you can connect to the Wi-Fi, you should be able to play with it. Uh, it's version 0 0.1. Don't expect too much of it. And the whole point of the app is to find a better name for it. Uh -huh. Uh, the features that I have is you can select a corpus, so the idea is you, sh you should be able to say, hey, I want to have something that sounds like a Pokemon, or Ikea name, or Esperanto, or whatever. Uh, you should be able to select a model and then click go, and it will generate a name for you. Um, but as a bonus feature, and this was sort of the main thing that I found out was the coolest thing, what might be even better is if you then say, don't generate the entire Pokemon name, but I want to have a, I want to make a new hipster database company. It has to have three characters that are unknown, but it has to end with base. Generate the first three tokens for me. This is sort of the main feature of the website, is you're able to do this. You're kind of being able to give me a sort of regex, and I'm going to make it sound as if it's a Pokemon by filling in the stars that you've given me. And this makes the problem easier and harder. So let's do a quick demo. Uh, do away with the cat. Uh, this is the website. And I now have to make sure the Wi-Fi works. So I will double check if the Wi-Fi is still working. It is still working. So the idea is there's a landing page, and I remind you of all the things that you could be naming, things like World of Warcraft Guild or a NASA rocket. The idea is we then give you this regex to this little robot, and we are going to make profit for you. 
Now, this is the whole app. Uh, I can click generate a bunch of times, and it's gonna, in this case, give me some Pokemon names, things that sound like Pokemon. Um, Obviously, the length of the Pokemon name is still an issue. Uh, and then we get to the autocomplete step. Um, I'll explain why this is slower, but the idea is when you generate this, uh, it's going to make things that sort of sound like a Pokemon. So if I were now to say I want to have a hipster startup that ends with Lee, maybe Hustley, Knuckly, that's not a good one, Emily, Jerly. Okay, crowd participation, any takers? Let's try. Sorry? Float C, like the, the end of Z. Busy, Jeezy, Wooly, Elizy. Reasonably sounding like a Pokemon. And the main gist that's also kind of cool is I can be very flexible with this. So if I wanted to start with a D and end with another token, I should be able to generate this on the fly. Not everything is as good, but this is what the app is supposed to do. It should be able to fill in the blanks. And this is kind of nice because this allows the user to give me more data to actually have less entropy uh, for the Pokemon name. Um, whereas if I had to start from here, uh, the, so there's lots of possibilities to go from. And here the user gives me input, I have to use that input, but then the, the input will actually help me get a better Pokemon name. Uh, this is the main thing I'm trying to build. And mathematically, that'll turn out to be actually kind of tricky. But we get the idea behind the app. This is what the app's supposed to do. Um, uh, and then, you know, hopefully for the future, what's probably going to happen is that uh, there's going to be a button here that says buy domain name, and I'll make dozens of euros. Uh, that's sort of the. the, I've, like, uh, the um, I was told today that there's like companies that specialize in making a name for a company. Uh, these are like the marketing firms and stuff. I'm totally going to disrupt that industry. Uh, that's sort of the, <laughs> the hope, I guess. Uh, so let's talk about the machine learning, because I thought that was sort of the interesting part. Because um, the moment you think of this, hey, we have to generate a sequence of tokens, the first thing you think of is, hey, that's a Markov chain. Uh, we basically have to calculate, given the letter that you have now, what's the probability for the next letter, sample that letter, move on, move on, move on, etc. It's a simple idea. You, you should be able to just be able to do this first. And you can make them more complicated. Instead of saying, let's do one step back, you might also be able to say, hey, let's look two steps back. So the previous two characters, that defined the new character that I'm going to get. And if you're going to sample, you first need to sample the first token, and then use a distribution to get the second token. And from that point on, you keep going and going and going. That's the idea. If you think about it, though, you don't have to do it forward. You can also conjure up any sort of chain, if you want, that just points in all sorts of different directions. You are not limited by just a forward Markov chain. Every arc that you see here is basically a probability distribution. And yes, I might be learning these probabilities, and they'll be slightly different here. But the shape of the graph is something that's independent. You can still sample any way or form. When I show you this, I also hope you kind of have an impression that we still have an issue that we have to solve, and that is, can anyone guess what the issue is? If I want to generate a Pokemon name, why am I not done yet? Markov chains will go on forever. That's the whole point of a Markov chain. It's sort of infinite. A Pokemon name typically is finite, uh, <laughs> if I look at the sample I have. Um, so I first need to come up with a nice way that says, hey, how long is the Pokemon name? And, and also, short Pokemon names, they might have different letters that start with different things. The easy trick you can do is you can sort of apply, you know, Bayesian statistics, and you can just say, well, first I'm going to sample the length of the token, of the, 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 the length of the sequence at least, and from then on I'll just apply the Markov chain. That's a thing you could do. But I hope you already kind of realize that this is a bit naive. The naive thing is, I f uh, if it's a very short Pokemon name, I'm probably going to use different letters than if it's a very long Pokemon name. So whatever I'm doing probabilistic here, I'm always still modeling. I would like to have this entropy defined better, but I, my model is still somewhat naive. It might still be good, though. So I just figured out, let's just try this approach. It's a simple Markov chain, and see how we get. And not all results are bad. I really think Utail could have been a Pokemon. Uh, Letip typically probably isn't a very good Pokemon name. I don't like the fact that there's two, uh, sort of three letters that aren't vowels. Uh, Keen is cool, I guess, is cool. Uh, but, but it's not completed there yet. Uh, when, when doing this for Pokemon, obviously, you also do it for IKEA furniture. Um, and I really, really hope I'm going to buy a Frodog couch someday. Uh, <laughs> or the Viz television set, or the Anapa meatballs, or what have you. Um, and and this, this is all kind of fun, and this sort of works. The words are not super long. My favorite one is just the Red Hot Chili Pepper lyrics, because when you read this, I actually feel that it's somewhat plausible that it is indeed the drug-induced lyrics from the, my, one of my favorite bands. Um, one thing you do see, for example, is um, 
Uh, now I'm sampling words, by the way, not characters, just to we emphasize that. But when things like by the way occur super, super often in a song called by the way, uh, then obviously by the way will also return in things you sample. Uh, the downside of everything I'm doing here as well is typically my sample is, size is not big. I don't have all the names of the United States. I have 700 or so Pokemon names and maybe 100 or so Red or Chili Pepper songs. So whatever I do, I have to keep in mind that my sample size is kind of small. I have to accommodate that, which actually also makes this problem rather hard. So I hope I've explained. The model is a bit naive and the results could be better. Uh, and also I've done the Markov chain explanation, but I've not explained yet how do you deal with known characters versus unknown characters. That part, that feature I've not explained fully yet. But I, but I did notice, hey, you know, I might be able to do something better, so what are some alternatives that I could consider? Well, for one, you could maybe build an ensemble. That usually works. That's what we learned from Random Forest. If I have a way of sort of, I start with the first token, and I have to generate the second token, this generates a probability distribution. I can do that for all three generated probability distributions, and then average those probability distributions, and then sample. Probably, that's a bit less naive. I kind of like the idea that instead of forward sampling, I might be able to do backward sampling and have those two things have an opinion on what's happening. Another alternative is I can actually use different lexicons. For example, what I could do is I could say, hey, here's a Pokemon, and I have a model for that, but I also have maybe the English language. That way I can kind of force, with a similar idea that I have here, but by using a second language as a second model, I might be able to force that my Pokemon names sound English, and therefore might actually be better in terms of vowels and consonants. And you might think that's a crazy idea, but turns out that what you could also do, the French translate everything, including Pokemon names. Pikachu is the only Pokemon that is not translated in the French language. In France, Snorlax is called Ronflex. Uh, Meowth is called Meows. <laughs> you could also do that. Uh, but then I would probably use a different corpus. Another thing you could do is you could use sort of the trans transducer trick, where you would say, hey, I've got this normal uh, Pokemon uh, uh, data set I have and I have a model for it. What I can also do then is I can say, hey, let's make a separate Markov chain that does something for vowels and non-vowels and makes a Markov chain out of that. And that's sort of a map phase you do before. And then you can still do the ensemble trick, but this will definitely prevent that you see four vowels in a row. Also, something I could consider. I can also kind of go for the adversarial approach. You know, you just have a model that says this is probably a fake Pokemon or a real one. You can make a classifier that does that. Then you have your generators generate 100 samples or so and have the other algorithm pick the best one of them. Might also be not a bad idea. What you can also do is you can kind of take a Levenstein approach. You start with a Pokemon that you already have, and then you say randomly pick a letter, and we're going to change that letter. The H changes into an R. Next, you see the A change into an O. Then this O changes into an E. The R changes to a B again, and this P changes into a K. If you do this often enough, and depending on what bis, uh, distance measure you use, it's also kind of possible that you come up with a Pokemon name that sounds reasonable. What I like about this is I'm not necessarily doing anything complex here, and I can take any sort of distance measure that I want. Um, one that I found out about yesterday, there's this thing called chart of ec. So what you actually can do is you can make character embeddings, and that way you could say, hey, if I'm replacing an O with an E, if I use the English language, uh, I can use this distance between characters to say how likely it is to sample uh, this letter if you replace it. Also, not a bad idea. But then, of course, all of my uh, peers at the PyData say, oh, what you should do, you should totally go for deep learning. That's like the best thing you can do, obviously, with 700 Pokemon names. Just use deep learning. Obviously, it's going to be better. There's papers and blogs and everything. Um, and here is sort of a moment where I went, wait, hold on, let's just stop. Um, because deep learning will never work for my second use case, I think. I, I'll gladly hear if I'm mistaken here, but I've asked it to a bunch of professors. It always turns out to be a hilarious conversation, if you're having this conversation with a professor. Um, my ultimate goal is, I, I, I like to sample a Pokemon name, but my ultimate goal is to complete one. And when I have this one example where I have a star, a U, a star, and an A, or a O, a U, a star, and an A, I hope it's super obvious that given all of these characters together, this should not be a vowel, it should be a consonant. It should be a K or an L, but it shouldn't be an E. Now, typically these neural network models, they work via some sort of, you have a start token, you sample a letter, and you keep on sampling until you reach a stop token. But what I kind of need here is I need a bi-directional way of going, and also there might be knowns and unknowns in there. And already I hope you might be able to do it if you have a bi-directional LSTM, and you might be able to fill in some of the letters. But again, this is a hobby project. No way is that the path forward. You might be, still be able to do it, but you're going to have to hack a lot. So I figured, let's drop deep learning straight from here, and how about I just go for simple algorithms instead?
it might just be good enough. And to be very honest, I first started this project thinking I only need to generate Pokemon names. But when I started playing with the idea you can actually give more information as a user, that's also the moment when I started noticing that people actually said, hey, this app is actually getting better. It wasn't so much a, a change in algorithm, more the change in the user interface that actually made the app better in terms of user experience. Better machine learning doesn't always lead to a better feature. It was also a nice lesson I learned from doing this. So how have I solved this then? The way that I did it is I basically said, you can look at this as a Markov chain. Another way of looking at it is to say, this is a probabilistic graphical model. And if the user gives me input that these are the characters that I need, then already I know the shape, the, the length of all the nodes in my probabilistic graph. And let's say the fact that I know the probability to get from here to here, that doesn't mean I cannot do inference from here to here. If I know the probability that if I roll a certain number of dice, the sum of the eyes will be a certain number, if I know that probability, then I can also infer that given the number of eyes, what dice have I rolled? The inference can work both ways if you only know one of the probabilities. So you can just apply that here. And even though I wouldn't directly sample this one first, what I would do is I would just sample, let's say, this one. Then I would sample the O. I know these probabilities because I inferred them from here. Then I sample the next one. And then I sample the next one. And it doesn't matter what shape I have. I can have multiple probabilistic graphical shapes, but the inference always works the same way. You basically say, given these things in a probabilistic graphical model, Bayes rule, what is the likelihood of this token? And you can do that for every single node in this graph. I don't like building a tool that does this, though. I like that, that, that there will be like a separate machine learning library that, that needs to do this. So it will be kind of nice if that already exists in a Python ecosystem. If you're ever going to do something like this, I have advice for you. There's a library called Markovify. Basically, you feed it any iterable with strings, and it will actually build a Markov chain on it. That's the simple version that will have a start token, a stop token, and it will just generate it for you. Markovify is nice for that one use case. For the advanced use case where I'm using this, I prefer to use a library called Pomegranate. Uh, the best way to describe Pomegranate is basically the scikit-learn, but so all the stuff that's missing from scikit-learn, if you're a bit more of a Bayesian, it's usually in Pomegranate. Um, it's a great machine learning library. It has hidden Markov chains. It has a nice API that's kind of scikit-learn-like. But a lot of these things that make this use case super easy is solely because of that library. It's built in Cython. It's pretty fast, and I really, really love it. You can build probabilistic graphical models with discrete variables with great ease. The way that the code sort of looks like is you have to import it, and then you say, here are all the Pokemon names. This is how far I'm willing to look back. And then it's going to cha train a Markov chain. Now, a Markov chain actually only has a few distributions, namely, how do you get from the first token to the second, and how do you get from the first and second token to the third, let's say, if you have a look back of three. You then have these distributions, and you can get them out of your Markov chain if you want to. If you train these distributions, and uh, the only thing you have to do then is you have to say, OK, given these trained distributions, make a new, uh, like at inference time, make a new Bayesian network, uh, add the states, which are all the tokens you could sample, and oh, that's, those are the probability distributions that I have here, uh, bake the network, and then give me the probabilities, given the things that I do know, what's the probability of all the other tokens? Pomegranate will just do this, all of this, what I just explained, with these seven lines of code. I don't want to do a tutorial on Pomegranate. I'm pretty sure you guys can read the documents yourself. But please check the library out. It's a super cool library. It should, NumFocus should support it. It's one of the best things out there. Also, the guy that made it, his, his name is Jacob. He's a cool dude. Send him an email. Give him a high five. OK, so I hope I got the math bit right. So I hope we have an impression why we like these probabilistic graphical models, and it's kind of flexible. But then I have to push this live. And the thing with this is, it is kind of a practical joke of projects. I do, I'm, I'm going to joke that I'm going to make dozens of euros. Uh, but, I don't, but it's probably just going to be something I can point to and laugh at. I don't want to spend dozens of euros on this per month. Preferably, I don't want to have some sort of server that's going to be able to handle all the traffic. But let's say I spent 10 euros a month. That's still 10 euros a month. That's 100 euros a year. For a gag project, it's actually kind of a lot of money. It's, it's, I actually want to have more of these projects. So I need to come up with a nice way to do this in a cheap uh, fashion. Let's first make an observation, though, because technically what I've just done is I've trained a machine learning model. And typically, as data scientists, when we have a machine learning model that does a certain task we like, we want to push that to production. So also, this task is rather general. So let's take a step back and consider the general situation. Typically, when you have a machine learning model, let's say you do a linear regression, you are calculating, let's say, uh, the price of a house based on the area of the, of the house, the number of bedrooms, the number of square meters, et cetera. 
Well, sure, you have to train this, and then you have a, a number for this parameter and for that parameter and so, but once you've trained all of that, the resulting function that you use to predict is a lambda function. If you put the same numbers in, the same numbers come out. It'll never change, it's a stateless function. So you don't need a stateful server to push this to production if you think about it. The only thing I need is a service that just allows this one function to be live. I, I think this is a, it's, it's not, so there are models where you do want every data point that comes in, the, the function updates, but anything from scikit-learn has this property. It's stateless. And that's actually kind of a powerful notion. Any trained machine learning model is proportional to a lambda. Technically, this isn't a pro perfect lambda function because I'm using the random state of the machine, so you, it's not super stateless, but it's stateless enough to prove the point that machine learning models typically are very stateless. So any service that allows me to provision stateless functions will be awesome. So let's do the super naive implementation. This is the function I want to have live, and uh, this is a super naive implementation because I'm in this one function, I'm also doing the training. I'm using Markovify to train the Pokemon names and then generate a random one and then send that back. But technically, all of that is just in this bit of code. I have all my Pokemon names, I'm turning it into a list because that's what Markovify wants. I'm making a chain of it, and then I'm saying, okay, make this text and uh, this text model, just do a random walk, return that. This is a Lambda function that can generate the content that I want for my website, let's say. In a simple case, right? This is the simple use case scenario. I just explained this. The idea then is, is there's this service on Amazon called Lambda. It's, it's sort of, we have servers, then we have VMs, then we have Docker, and now the idea is you don't provision a server in a Docker container, you just say, this is a function, just run this function in the cloud for me, please. So what I will show you now is how to provision like your first hello world, how to provision this to AWS, such as you have a REST endpoint that can generate random Pokemon names. Well, the first thing that you have to do is you have to, like Amazon doesn't know all your dependencies from heart, so what you have to do is you have to make sure that all the dependencies that you have go to Amazon, because you're provisioning a function that needs all these dependencies. So what you need to do is you have to pip install the library that you want, but save it in a separate path such that you can zip that, this, both the library and your own function, such that together can go to Amazon. Now this is a, a sucky bit because we're going to click a lot now. Um, you go to Amazon, you'll get to this screen. This is something called um, API Gateway to Lambda. You're going to click a few buttons, clickety click, click, clickety click, click, and then uh, you're going to say there's a Lambda microservice. Uh, it's going to be on production. Clickety click, click, clickety click, click. You're going to upload the zip file with all the code I just told you about. You're going to name your function. You're going to describe that it does a super useful Pokemon task. You can also say which runtime it is because you can do stuff in Python but also Node. I believe when I did this, they only had Python. 2.7, thankfully now we can do 3.6 as well, which is cool. Clickety click, click, clickety click, click. We've just provisioned a function, but the function needs to be hooked up to the internet, so you're gonna click around a bunch more. Then the idea is you have to say, hey, you should be able to get to this Pokemon names endpoint, um, and you can have versioning and all that, uh, but you can only get it by get requests, so the way you access the Lambda function, there's all sorts of provisioning for that as well. Um, note that a Lambda function can also be triggered by, let's say, a, a change in S3. It's not just web requests that, that trigger the function, you use it for other stuff as well. But in my main use case, I just want a person who's on my, uh, you know, page to say, hey, slash, uh, I want to generate a Pokemon name, ping, ping, back, and ping. One thing you might want to do is, uh, hint, because this will go wrong if you don't do it, one of the things you can then also set is something like a course header. A course header says only people that go to tenacity.com slash API, only those people can get to the data, otherwise people with a simple curl request can also get there. There are some security settings you probably want to set here as well. I'm going to repeat this later because it's super important that you know this, um, but there's extra settings you can do here too. Once you've done all of this, you've done the clicky clicky, here's the features that Amazon tells you that you have. Supposedly you get the first one million requests for free, um, depending on how often the function is used, the latency I, f I typically get tends to be about 200 milliseconds. You can like, have a function that has more resources and then it's kind of quicker, but okay, without any settings, I kind of have between 200 milliseconds and a second uh, of response time. Not bad, but I would like to uh, maybe improve that. Uh, apparently, supposedly it's only 20 cents for every next million or so, and I think nowadays it's 10 cents per million requests. Um, supposedly, I don't have to worry about scaling. Amazon will do this for me. Um, it's relatively easy to update if you think about it, but it's a bit of an immature architecture. So it's just a function. So I can push that to Git, uh, but I probably want to automate a bunch of steps that I have right now. 
One thing I will say, this is obviously a cloud lock-in. Uh, if you do this on Amazon this way, um, Note that Google at the moment doesn't have Python support yet, and I don't like Windows, so I'm, you're probably stuck with Amazon if you're going to go down this route. The thing that's actually kind of nice is then, you know, obviously I would like to compare this to, let's say, a 10 euro Flask server. Like, how does this compare? 10 minutes, got it. Um, and let's say this Flask server, it can handle 100 requests per second. Well, Suppose that I have 100 requests per second, and I, I have like a high 100 requests per second for eight hours a day or so. Uh, Lambda functions are actually still a fair bit cheaper these days. So it is kind of a contender, and the idea behind this is if I don't use the Lambda function because it's a hobby project, I pay zero. Only when a lot of people end up using it, that's when I pay. Now, that's, that's super useful for my use case, but I will say for other production tasks, it's actually kind of cool, because typically when you apply a machine learning model, that's when you start earning money. Usually you apply it to get money in return. This way, you, it doesn't cost you anything if you're not making extra money. So that, there is some economic benefit that could be had here. I'm not sure how much I like the logging and the bugging, though, because this is an, a function that's now live. It's something I have to maintain. And what I haven't talked about yet is how I do logging on a Lambda function like this. What I haven't talked about is how you debug something like this. Because um, you still need to do a bit of engineering here. You probably do want to push some output to Elasticsearch or Kibana or something that Amazon offers. And for your front end, you still probably want to have something like Sentry to keep an eye on the errors that you get back from your function. You still need to do a fair bit of engineering, but there are some nice things that you get. Bit of warning. I did this for my first time, and then my website went down. Amazon can go down. Um, so th I think two months ago it went down, and the first thing I, d I always do when a website goes down, I go to the website isitdowntoday.com. The downside is, isitdowntoday.com is hosted on S3, so that website was down. The internet responded by saying there's this other website, is isitdowntodaydowntoday.com. <laughs> that website is now also down. <laughs> um, this joke is an obvious joke, but it's here also to remind you cloud services can fail. It's super infrequent, but when it does, things go bad. And you, in, in this situation, you cannot just say, okay, same server, go to whoop, other region. Uh, it's, it's a little bit more tricky than that. You still have contingency planning you might want to be mindful of. Um, so I just talked about this. Also, this function, uh, you might want to have some authentication layer. I haven't talked about that yet. Maybe only if you log in do you get access to this machine learning model. And also, we have to automate a bunch of this stuff. Um, another thing that's kind of useful to remember, if you have a 10 euro Flask server and you get a DDoS attack, sure, the server will go down, but you're not going to pay more for it. If you're going to get a DDoS attack, Amazon will scale horizontally on your behalf. <laughs> so. There are throttling and stuff that you can do. Amazon's there to help you as well. But these are things you have to be kind of aware of. It's not a free lunch. Uh, and I kind of have to go over stuff so quickly. So um, how many requests do you need to get pwned? Uh, like, uh, let's say pwned by definition is if I have to spend $1,000 in a month. Then the guy or girl that's hacking you really only needs to spend 3,800 requests a second. That is manageable. Like, people can pwn you this way. So throttle, keep it in mind. Now, let's do this a bit more maturely, and I'll go over this relatively fast because I want to have some time for questions. We ought to automate some of this stuff and talk about some of the downsides of this because uh, right now I've uploaded a simple library that has no real dependencies, but if you're going to do something with scikit-learn, this uploading to Amazon step is actually a bit more complicated. A few more things you have to know. You notice that one of the functions I used that generated the normal Pokemon and the one that had completed, the completed Pokemon took longer to return a value. The idea behind Lambda functions is they're not always live. The concept is if this one function is after five minutes no longer being used, Amazon sort of kills the container that the function is being run in, five minutes, um, basically to prevent costs from going sky high. Remind yourself, you might want to have a cron job that queries this uh, endpoint just to ensure that the function is always hot. A thing to be mindful of, you can do cool stuff where you say, hey, uh, let's do an API design because I have a model and a corpus and complete that, and you can sort of do nice frameworks here. You can also abstract things away, which is nice. Um, I will say what I have been using is the first example that I showed, we train this uh, function while you run it. More ideally, you would cache this. Uh, what I have actually done is I cache it in every single Lambda function. So I've built a command line app that makes a function for me, and you have a Markov uh, model for Pokemon, and that's a separate function. To me, that seems like the easiest way to cache this stuff, just have many different Lambda functions. If, that's not necessarily the easiest way to maintain it, but otherwise you would need to provision a database to do this caching for you. Um, 
this picture. Um, because I'm working on my own, a bit of advice I will give to automate a lot of this configuration. Why not make your own command line app? Uh, it, it's been the most sane way for me to deal with a lot of these things. Because I have to make a command line app that can take all the data that I have, train the model, and then push live. Either I can automate this with all sorts of Ansible scripts, but actually, because I like to be hacky and also pass credentials the right way, it's not too bad of an idea to just build a Python app that does this. And if you use an app called Fire, it's actually kind of fun to do. It really brings back the joy in making command line apps. So this is a preview. I've got Tenas Learn. I can say generate all models, and based on the folder where my text files are, it generates all of this. It, keep it sane, automate all of this, and keep it in Git. That's also kind of nice. Be mindful, if you're going to do something with scikit-learn, this will bite you. Amazon uses its own Docker container to run your stuff. And if you're using NumPy, it needs BLAS, and BLAS is compiled differently on my Mac than on that container. So the whole zipping up the code thing needs to happen on their Docker container, not your machine. Keep this in mind. There's tutorials online. Um, there's actually a full tutorial here. I won't go over it, but it's, uh, it's in the slides. It's already on the GitHub. Skip, skip, skip. If you're going to automate this, I will still use a command line app, but there are also levels of abstraction these days that you can use if you're doing this. There's a thing called CodeStar, where Amazon controls your GitHub repository, but every time you push to master, there's a build step, a test step, and then a push to production step that Amazon handles for you. Super nice, but vendor lock-in. There's another project called Chalice, also by Amazon. It's an easy way to get your Python Lambda functions to production, also lock-in. There's another project called Zappa, and they're less of the vendor lock-in, and what they try to do is they want to make sure that you can do this both to Google once they start having Python, as well as Amazon. If I were you, I would pick for Zappa. It seems more open source and cool. Um, there are other cloud services out there. Uh, Google probably will have Lambda functions for Python. I cannot imagine they're going to stick with Node. Azure, I guess, also have it, but I have a mega hard issue with Microsoft. Um, the personal history, I've never got that laptop to work properly. Um, so it will take a lot of time for me to convince me to go to Azure, but they do have Python. It's says so on the website, so it might be true. In conclusion, and I kind of had to go over it quickly because I want to have some functions, uh, so some questions. Lambda cloud functions are actually kind of cool. Uh, it's a good idea for machine learning practitioners to just say, train machine learning model, cloud, done. Scales horizontally. You don't have to be the DevOps guy. Well, you still kind of have to be it, but less so than before. Servers have a, so a server can fill in multiple ways, and you might be responsible for it. This is a service from Lambda, and it's super cheap. There is a lot of lock-in, um, but I think you can do either AWS or Google Cloud. Having said that, you could usually also just provision a server, right? So this is a hobby project, and I want the cost to be low. If you're doing this on your own, provisioning a Flask server might also be a way to solve this. You don't need Lambda. It's just an alternative for you guys. One thing I will say, give probabilistic graphical models a chance. If you've never done anything with probabilistic graphical models, this would have been a hard task. If you have done something with probabilistic graphical models, this task takes five minutes. I really think the uh, deep learning algorithm would uh, not be feasible here. Probabilistic graphical models are easy to design, they're easy to debug, they're easy to deploy, and these are all things that I care for. Thanks. That was all right. Thanks, Vince, and great talk just in time. So we have five, six minutes for questions. <laughs> Hey, thank you very much for this uh, very entertaining and interesting talk. You're welcome. Um, I have one quick question. Sure. Uh, the 200 milliseconds uh, hot deployment execution time for Lambda function, yep. how much of that uh, was uh, your code running, and how much of that was that open? Oh, um, so in this particular case, I'm also training, right? <laughs> uh, so that ha doesn't help. But uh, so what you can do is you can fiddle around with the resources. A Lambda function is in a Docker container, which has resources. And typically, I think it has a certain amount of megabytes RAM, certain CPU, et cetera. You can put more stuff in there. The Lambda co functions will cost a bit more, uh, but that that could half the time easy. We've we've done some experiments with that. But the cool thing as well is um, if you put more resources in the Lambda function, the code runs quicker, which means you pay less per function. Uh, there's there's optimizations I haven't touched upon. Definitely, you can make it quicker. Just a quick one about the length of the Pokemon name. Yes. Uh, why didn't you simply add like spaces to the characters in your Markov chain? So a Pokemon name currently usually only has one name. And not no, 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 no. <laughs> I mean like like just add uh, spaces to the uh, possible characters and then just break after space. Um, 
fair, but um, that you could also use a stop and, and end token for that, right? So you could also say we start, you sample a start token, then the first letter, and you continue on until you sample a stop token. That, that's also an approach you could do. Uh, I found though that uh, for generating normal Pokemon names, this approach would work, but there's many alternatives, and I just want to do the simple thing first. I actually found that the use case where the user supplies me the letters they actually want, that gives the best user experience. So that's the main use case I'm focusing on. But definitely you can improve stuff this way. That's, uh, that's a fair call. Uh, very nice uh, project. Uh, I have a question. Um, why not just uh, taking your initial very simple idea of, uh, with this Markov chains? Yes. Um, define a loss function on the outcome? Yeah, and how would you define hundreds, it? So it's easy, it's easy to say just define a loss function. Uh, the problem here is I only have 700 or so Pokemon names, so whatever loss function I come up with will also be biased due to my s small data set size. Yeah, sure. That's but, what that, uh, that is tricky. Uh, when your train model also will be biased. Like, uh, so I, I have done some experience with this, but more for the adversarial approach, and the results were like modestly, hardly noticeably better. Mm -hmm. Like I would show it to my colleagues and they would say, Vincent, it's the same rubbish. Okay, may maybe <laughs> I will ask you later. Okay, so I'm, I'm open to any suggestions to this. Uh, again, the main use case though that I have found, and it's also kind of like the joy, uh, it's not so much the machine learning, it's, it's the entire use case. If you can put in your own, let's say, uh, three letters, it has to end with base, uh, com base, and uh, slee base, and uh, oh, foo base, that's a great library for a database written in JavaScript. Um, <laughs> or Cafefe, whatever. Um, uh, it's, it's that one use case that I found out that people actually like to play with, so that's the thing I'm optimizing for. Uh, this other use case, I guess, is cute, but this is, of course, just a random, uh, random Markov chain. And not super, this is the main use case I really care for. Just uh, thanks a lot, and mm -hmm. uh, one aside, uh, there's a German, um, more or less nerdy hoster. They do virtual servers. Uh, uh -huh. You get one with 10 gig uh, of space mm -hmm. for one euro a month. Okay, that's not bad. And if you want to push a domain on that, you can, yeah, so can do that. The only thing you don't get is Docker because then you would have super user rights on the server and they don't give you that. So the, 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 the just, just as a note for... Yeah, I know. so, so I've, I've been looking at these services as well. There's also another service called Hyper where you have Docker containers that only contain like 46 gigs of RAM, or megabytes of RAM. The main thing with Amazon though is I do want to have a cloud provider that, should I need it, has support for S3. And a lot of these other services, they have like a niche use case, but not the general, all the other stuff. Just to plug them, they are called Uberspace. They're called Uberspace. Dot de. Dot de. Uberspace. Dot de. Yes, and and so and if I spell it correctly, it's, like, it's Uber months. like Uber and space as in space. Dot de. <laughs> okay. Oh, well, then we'll save it on camera, so that's good. <laughs> ah, we've we've plugged them twice. I think that's fine. Do you have a question? Is it about Uberspace de? <laughs> No, it's about step functions. When ah, I, I have a feeling it's not going to be a question, but sure. Uh, no, <laughs> when will you write this to A? Because Amazon, one thing is it changes quickly, yes. so you write all this, then uh, in December step functions come, and in uh, February price in 3.6 came, and so are you trying to keep it uh, up to date? Well, uh, that's also why I like having the command line app. Because uh, um, the way I like to write software is kind of like Legos. If there's one block in the chain somewhere that changed, I just need to change the one block. So if the service provider changes, I don't have to redo the way I train my models. It's still the same command line app. Uh, to me, this seems like the most sane way of dealing with it. I, I mean, I can also train a deep learning model to try to predict what Amazon's going to do, but uh, I think that's more effort. Cool, thank you. So let Any other questions, uh, uh, Pokemon related question? or actual questions can be also done. One, one, more question. one last question, we have okay, one minute. One more. Fine. Um, in, in my opinion, this generation step could run on the browser. So you could just have a static page, put it on a CDN, yeah, and so no, not worry about anything. For this model, you would be absolutely right. However, in my enterprise version, we'll also have deep models, obviously. Uh, and then, <laughs> uh, so the, the, the main reason, when I started all this, I kind of knew I needed some form of backend, because I didn't know if deep learning was going to win or not. And the, the main lesson for me as well is, this is a humorous project, I'll be having many. <laughs> and I just have a nice scalable way for that, that I don't have to worry about costs so much. I only have to worry about DDoS attacks. Just, just, I only have to worry about these DDoS attacks. <laughs> Which, you know, just put CloudFormation up front of it. It's fine. Yeah, AWS has it, but, um, but I've heard Uberspace is also great. <laughs>
Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Vincent.